is this better or is that this helps. Yeah. okay sorry um okay so hopefully you can see the indigo agenda at the moment is that correct yes okay great that means i actually chose the right thing excellent okay so um hi everyone uh thanks very much for hanging around um so today uh, I'm going to be giving a tutorial on PyHF. Uh, I'm going to apologize a little bit in advance because unlike the other organizers that are giving talks uh, this week, I was caught, caught a little shorthanded. And so I'm almost certain that this is not going to take a full 45 minutes. But uh, we can go ahead and just see how, how far we get. But uh, if, if, I tend, if I'm rambling too much and it gets past 30 minutes, I'd ask that the uh, the, uh, the chairs go ahead and uh, get the cane and reel me in so we can focus on questions. So uh, I wrote this tutorial to really try and be interactive. So I'd really encourage everyone to follow along with me uh, at home if they, if they wouldn't mind. So uh, if you go to the Indigo agenda, you'll find that um, under the PyHF Accelerated Analyses and Preserving Likelihoods tutorial, there is a link to Jupyter Book. Uh, so if you go ahead and click that, uh, that will open up to, uh, to the tutorial page, which is um, uh, written in Jupyter book. And if we go into full screen mode, that hopefully is a little bit more readable. Uh, okay, so welcome everyone. Um, so right now, uh, you should be looking at the, the, the book screen. And this is going to be focusing just on a few core things in PyHF today. We're really not going to dive into the full pedagogy of what's actually happening statistically in terms of his factory models or any of that, it's more just kind of a usage of how you would actually do things in PyHF. So uh, if you are interested in more finer details, I'd recommend that you go to the PyHF uh, documentation website, which is linked here. Uh, there we've got uh, kind of a much more, we have links to both papers that we've written as well as much more in-depth explanations of the statistics, as well as some more interactive examples as well. Um, so also, if you're, uh, since we're going to be glossing over a lot of introductory material, uh, if you're interested in any of this, you can just click right here, which will take you to uh, the talk that uh, I gave at SciPy 2020 last week, which is kind of a much more introductory view of all of this. Um, and for this tutorial, if you're following along, uh, we're going to use binders, so everything is already containerized for you and set up. But if you're going to be doing this at home on your own uh, machine, you'd want to first be able to set up uh, PyHF. And so uh, to install PyHF on your machine, first, uh, like all same software development, we're going to make a Python virtual. Oh, sorry. Um, OK. I'm also going to turn up the gain on my microphone. And uh, Harish, does that help now? Can you give me a thumbs up or down? Or... Uh, OK, I, I'm not seeing anything in chat, so I'm going to assume that I'm going to assume that people can hear me, but um, OK, we'll see. Um, so if, if you can't hear me, just yell in chat again. I'll try and monitor, monitor that. Uh, right, so like all software development, we want to start with uh, making a Python virtual. Oh, OK. A Python virtual environment. Uh, and then we're just going to pip install PyHF straight from PyPI. Uh, but as of today, you can also install us from Conda Forge. So, if, uh, so you can also, if you have a Conda environment, you can just uh, add the, make sure you have the Conda Forge channel um, added, and then uh, just Conda install PyHF. Um, but if you're going to be trying to do uh, things with PyHF, such as uh, be able to read uh, his factory models that might be already existing in uh, root file formats or things like that, then you probably also want some of the other nice tools that exist in the scikit hep ecosystem. Uh, so you, you can also go ahead and pip install us with some extras. So if you do pip install PyHF XML IO, then you'll also uh, get uproot as well so that you can read, read root files in as well. Um, but for the purposes of just making sure that all the Jupyter notebooks that exist in this tutorial run, uh, you simply just need to run from, uh, if you're doing this at home, just run pip install uh, and then use this requirements.txt file, which has everything in there. Uh, I mentioned the scikit hep ecosystem, and I guess this is as good a time of any just to mention that PyHF is part of uh, the scikit hep uh, ecosystem, uh, but then we're also an IRIS hep funded project. 
Okay, so now that we've uh, at least covered how to get PyHF and get going, we can kind of move on to uh, his factory statistical models in just a, a short view. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm lazy and I went ahead and uh, just stole some slides from a, from a website, so that's why things look a little bit weird. But before I go any further, I also want to make sure that I introduce the PyHF core development team. So we're Lucas Heinrich, who's a, a CERN fellow. Uh, myself, I'm a postdoc at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, where uh, I'm also uh, where I work on Atlas and as well as Iris Hep. And then we also have Jordan Stark, who's a postdoc in Atlas at UC Santa Cruz. Um, okay, so if we ask first, just what is actually the His Factory statistical model? Uh, the simple answer is that it's a flexible probability, probability density function template. Uh, to build statistical models in, in high energy physics, and it's uh, very, very common uh, in ATLAS. Uh, it was used, uh, it was developed as part of the work that actually led to the Higgs discovery back in 2011, um, and it's widely used in, in the high energy physics community, mostly uh, for both measurements of standard model physics as well as uh, searches for beyond the standard model uh, physics as well. And so these are just two different plots taken from analyses in which uh, his factory statistical models have actually been used. Uh, the, the Higgs discovery being a noticeable one for them. Um, okay, but if we actually look at what the His factory statistical template is, we see that's actually a pretty uh, straightforward uh, thing. We can basically decompose it into two main parts. We have uh, this main piece here in blue, which is this product of Poisson's. Um, and then we have this, uh, which is just over uh, all channels, over all bins. It's this product of the Poissons. Uh, and then we have this uh, term in red on the right-hand side, which uh, allows us to bring in different auxiliary constraint PDFs to, uh, to, that can help us bring in information about systematic uncertainties uh, or uh, different auxiliary measurements. But I'm gonna pause momentarily here just to kind of break down what some of these words mean because it is still introducing a bit of jargon. Um, so, we'll do, so we'll do that by simply just uh, looking at uh, this plot here. Uh, so this is, as I said, a, this, is a, this is a SUSY analysis that is actually using his factory and we'll break down what basically everything in here represents. So each bin in this plot here actually represents uh, a different channel. And so a channel you can basically just think of as uh, the analysis selections that you be, would be applying, right? So, uh, so this is a multi-channel um, multi analysis uh, where each bin represents a different channel, a different event selection. Uh, and then in each of these channels, you have different samples. And the samples, as we can see here, are just the different physics processes that would then go into that event selection. And so, you, so each of these stacked colored histograms represents a different sample. Um, so, uh, and you can see that there's uh, different, uh, that obviously the different process, uh, processes exist across different channels, uh, but th that these samples might also share different uh, systematics, such as normalization, systematic uncertainties and things. And so, when we actually produce this, um, this, this, this statistical model, we're really just more saying, okay, we're gonna take a way for us to describe our physics analysis and put it into a bin statistical model that we can then do a simultaneous fit for. Uh, and, so, and then you can see that we both take into account the, the events, our observations on auxiliary data, as well as our uh, full model parameters. Okay, uh, but if we actually look at how we describe the His Factory statistical model, we're doing this all in a declarative JSON specification. Uh, so previously, if you've been working with His Factory statistical models, you've most likely been doing this uh, using, um, using just root uh, and root it, restats, those sorts of things. But so PyHF is taking a departure here because we wanna make sure that we have a, uh, a, a serialization file format that allows us to be flexible, but also allows us to be able to try and preserve and, and, and use, these, uh, use these likelihoods in an in a, in a, in a aggressive and smart manner. So what does JSON give us that uh, root doesn't? Um, well, to begin with, you are currently looking at like a real, uh, a real likelihood specification right here, but you can read that yourself. So 
JSON is both human, human and machine readable, and it gives us a fully declarative specification, which is very powerful. And also, it's worth noting that JSON is an industry standard, uh, and so it's basically going to be with us until the heat death of the universe. So we have this long, long-term stability baked in uh, to the fact that, uh, and it, when you combine that with the fact that JSON is basically parsable in pretty much every programming language that exists, it's super, super portable, so we don't suffer lock in from choosing uh, choosing this. And especially that's important if we want to be able to use these uh, these uh, likelihoods farther out in the future when we might be using different programming languages, this model serial serialization is still totally valid. And additionally, JSON is still just plain text, right? So that means that it's versionable and uh, very easily preserved. And that makes it extremely attractive uh, for um, for analysis preservation, and it's also extremely compressible. So as we'll see later, you can actually uh, just store the full public, uh, full likelihood for an analysis up on HEP data that is then preserved indefinitely. Okay, um, but now let's actually dive in and look at this JSON spec a bit more. And for that, we're now going to actually dive into Binder. So I'm going to click out of uh, full screen mode, and in Jupyter Book, I'm now going to go up here to this launch button, and I'm going to launch into Binder. And so Binder uh, should be spinning up. It should already have found a built image for us, and so it should be launching our uh, our Jupyter server for us. And now we're dropping in on Google Cloud, and uh, once we get in here, this should open up uh, the notebook we were just inside of as well. Uh, if you give it a second, cool. Right, so now I'm going to go into view mode, and I'm going to go into presentation mode so people can hopefully see this, um, or see this better at least. I'll also try and just uh, zoom in a little bit to see if, make my screen bigger. Um, can someone in chat just say if, if this is good in terms of, uh, in terms of size? I'm gonna continue, but assume that assume that it's okay. Okay, great, thanks very much. Okay, right, so this is the JSON spec, again, a declarative specification of the entire statistical model. And you can read this just fine, but let's also now dive in and try and break this apart so you don't have to look at so many braces. Okay, so what this is, I'm just gonna read out in our documentation website what we actually describe this as. So this. This demonstrates a simple measurement of a single tube and channel with two samples, a signal sample and a background sample. The signal sample has an unconstrained normalization factor mu, um, while the background sample occurs an uncorrelated shape, shape systematic that's controlled by two, parameter, uh, two parameters. And the background uncertainty for the bins uh, is 10 and 20% respectively. So let's actually step through and try and verify and understand that a bit more. So the very first thing we're gonna do is we're just going to uh, import uh, PyHF and we're gonna import JSON um, because like I said, these are JSON, uh, serial, they're serialized as JSON. And then we're also just going to open up the spec uh, and load it into a, a PyHF workspace. So we do that. Uh, but now that we have this in a workspace, we actually wanna do something with it. And so we're gonna create a statistical model and we're now just going to, to uh, dump out the model specification just to take a very quick look at it. Okay, so you can see that we have a subset of the above, uh, of the above specification, the above likelihood, where right this, the model is only taking into account the statistical model side. The data isn't really there. Um, so, but now let's try and, uh, this is still kind of ugly to look at, so let's clean this up a little bit. We're just going to create this um, pretty JSON print function, and then we're gonna look at this again. Um, okay, so now this has been prettified a little bit, and so we can much more clearly see that the model specification now just basically has the channels and the samples that I had mentioned earlier. But let's still further dive in again, because this is still a whole bunch of braces and white space to look at. Okay, so let's break down just from the beginning. We said that this is demonstrating a simple measurement of a single tube in channel. So we're going to use uh, PyHF uh, to just inspect this um, and look at the, the model specification, the channels. Since this is JSON, we basically are now treating this just as you would a dict. Uh, so we're basically creating a single channel dict uh, where we're just looking at the first element. 
and we see that, okay, what is in the channels for this model? There's just one element that has a name of single channel. And if we then ask uh, using the model config channel and bins, how many bins are here? Two. Okay, so that checks out. That's good. Okay, uh, and then if we further break down that specification, it said samples. There's two samples, so let's query the model configuration again. Okay, we so we have two samples, a background sample and a signal sample. And if we go ahead and uh, prettify the JSON there, then we again see that, okay, we can very clearly see these two samples that are in our, our signal channel. Uh, but this is still, again, a lot of information, so let's further break it down one more time. Okay, so it says that for the signal sample, there's, uh, there's an unconstrained uh, normalization factor mu. So if we look at what are the actual uh, modifiers that are associated with this model configuration, we see that we have a normalization factor called mu and a shape systematic called uncorrelated background uncertainty. So it's clear just from this uh, description that this first one is our signal one, but we'll further uh, take a look at that. And indeed, when we actually go ahead and investigate uh, what is the um, what is the modifiers, which is the language that we use to talk about these these things, what is the modifiers that are associated with the signal sample? We get a norm factor, a normalization factor called mu. So that uh, that seems to check out because that's just scaling the signal, um, right? And so then the background sample carries an uncorrelated shape, systematic controlled by two parameters: gamma one, gamma two. The gammas, these are just the model parameters that we associate with this, with this shape systematic. And again, we'll just actually inspect that now. And there we see that for these, uh, uh, for the background, we have this shape systematic um, and there's uh, 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 across the two bins. And as we also mentioned, the background uncertainty for the bins is 10 and 20% respectively. We can very easily verify this by just taking the um, by just saying that uh, we're going to access the data that is associated with this uh, uncorrelated background uncertainty, and then we're just going to compare that to the background sample data itself, uh, so the counts basically, and we see that we get 10% and 20%. Um, okay, and then you'll also notice that again, since all of this is JSON and JSON, you know, it's a natural thing to think of have it living on the web. It also means that if you have a PyHF, um, if you have a PyHF workspace JSON file lying around somewhere in the public internet, you can just curl it down or use request to access it. So here we're going to import the request library where we have this remote URL, this endpoint that actually uh, is this file that's just publicly available. And we're just gonna use the JSON library from uh, Python to go ahead and load it and then prettyfy it. Um, uh, yeah, that, that, that works too, Nick. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then you can see that we have the exact same, uh, uh, we have the exact same uh, workspace that we, when, uh, likelihood of workspace specification that we started off with. Uh, so that means that's nice in the sense that you can access these things anywhere. But you'll notice, um, uh, you'll notice that we have these, um, uh, that we've been looking at the model parameters so far, but we also have these observations and measurements. So let's, and we also have a version spec. Um, okay, so for observations, uh, so the observations are just the data that's associated with the workspace, with the likelihood. Uh, for us to be talking about the likelihood, we care about both the model as well as the, uh, the observed data, data that goes with that. Uh, if we go ahead and just ask the workspace, what is the data that it has available for the model though? This is a two bin model, but you'll notice that we get uh, four pieces of data that's returned. And the reason why is because uh, this is both the actual observations as well as the auxiliary information that we get from the His factory PDF. Uh, so if we then just ask with the without the auxiliary information, then we see that we just get back the uh, 50 and 60, which are, are the counts in the two bins that we see that are here in the observations. Uh, we can, of course, then also just ask the model configuration for its auxiliary data, and we see that we get uh, 10 and 25. So this uh, just sums up what, what the observations are. And then similarly, the measurements uh, in, in the workspace are just what are the actual things that we're trying to measure, what are our parameters of interest. 
And so here uh, we, we just have uh, mu, which is our signal strength. This is the thing that we actually care about. OK, so that was a very drawn out, uh, just kind of hopefully gory, but maybe educational description of what actually is inside of these models, uh, inside of these JSON specifications. Um, oh, so I'm going to, uh, I'll, I see Ben just posted a question. I'll go ahead and uh, just keep that uh, for the end uh, so we can keep moving on. But that's a good question. Please upload it. Uh, <laughs> Um, okay, so that was kind of gory, but let's say that you're an analyst and you don't want to just stare at JSON all day. Uh, that's good. You should keep it that way. So we PyHF also provides command line utilities to try and make this a less painful experience. So uh, at the command line, if you have uh, a file someplace, you can just run PyHF inspect. And uh, you'll see that it get, then just prints to screen a very nice summary of what's actually going on here. As we said before, we have a single channel with two samples and, uh, and two bins. And it then also gives us helpful information about all of this. So this is really the tool that you want to, to use when you're trying to just get quick summary information. If your friend sends you a, um, a His Factory a specification, uh, this is what you're going to use. But we want to first just introduce what's going on. OK, so now that we hopefully have a better understanding of uh, the His Factory model, Let's click on over to this inference notebook. Uh, and now we can actually start doing some hopefully more interesting uh, analysis, analysis. So we have our models. Let's now do statistical inference with them. So we're in a new notebook. So we're just going to go ahead and reimport PyHF and JSON. And then similarly, we're going to reload uh, the, that data and again, or that, that JSON uh, model. And we're going to go ahead and create another, works or another workspace and model. Um, and then now we're also going to just uh, use the model config and the data uh, access API to load the model parameters and data into two different objects. And the reason is because we now want to try and investigate the inference API that PyHF provides. Uh, and so since we're interested in constructing the log likelihood that's conditioned on the data, uh, and since the likelihood is you can view it as um, as having the same mathematical form as the probability density function, of course, with a cor with a corresponding uh, scaling coefficient, we can use the we can do this by uh, using the log PDF uh, API that we provide, um, and we and you see here that what this is evaluating is just the log PDF of the model for uh, the, these specific model parameters that are conditioned on the data, and the model parameters that we chose here are just some suggested initialization parameters. Um, OK, but now let's say that we actually want to try and do some statistical inference with this model that we have. Uh, so now let's perform a maximum likelihood estimate fit. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to use the inference API that PyHF provides. Uh, and we're providing it both uh, the data as well as the model. Um, and then we're also going to tell it that we want it to return the fitted value of the objective function as well. So if we go ahead and do this, um, then we now see that we're printing out the best fit parameters of, uh, of the statistical model when beforehand they were just one, one, and one. Um, and then what actually is this objective function that we returned? It turns out it's uh, minus two times um, uh, the negative log likelihood, or it's, or it's uh, sorry, it's twice the negative log likelihood. And we can explicitly verify this by, again, just now taking the log PDF API that we have, and now taking these best fit parameters and evaluating uh, the, log, the log PDF uh, for these best fit parameters condition on the data times minus two. And we see that it's the same thing that we got back when we asked for the return fitted value. OK, so we've at least started to look a bit more at the fact that you can do different sorts of uh, statistical fits with PyHF. Um, but now let's actually do kind of the meat of the things that we're interested in, which is hypothesis testing. Uh, so very often in different physics analyses, we care about actually computing the CLS value. Uh, and I won't go into it here. Uh, but for those who aren't really familiar with what a CLS value is, you can just, um, at a very, very high level, you can just think of it as being a modified pseudo-frequentist p-value uh, that's there to help make sure that we don't uh, exclude uh, models where we really don't even have sensitivity to begin with. Um, there's more, of course, lots more, but I'm trying to summarize. Uh, so now we can actually use the hypothesis testing uh, API that PyHF provides to 
get access to CLS values. So let's say that we want to test our, um, our model and we want to test it with a uh, test um, signal strength of one. Uh, so just like what the standard model or what theory would say would predict. So that's what that test value means. So we'll simply just use the hypothesis test, the hypo test API for our test value of our uh, signal strength, our parameter of interest, and then our data and our model. And we're also going to return uh, the expected, uh, set return expected keyword argument to true, so that we not only get back the observed CLS value, but as uh, we'll also get back the expected. We go ahead and run that, and we get that back pretty fast. Um, and then just as a statistical aside, if we remember that the CLS uh, value itself is actually a ratio of probabilities, um, we can explicitly verify that Pi, how PyHF is doing things like this uh, under the hood because we can use the return tail probs uh, keyword argument to now rerun this again to get both the CLS uh, values as well as the uh, CL, CLSB and CLB values. So we get those and we can now explicitly test this by actually saying, okay, does the CLS uh, value that we observe, is that equal to the ratio of these probabilities? And the answer is yes, because the cert value passes. All right, so that's, that's great, but we're still interested in actually uh, doing some uh, hypothesis testing. And if you're setting limits, then something you usually care about as well is getting a band of expected CLS values, which is uh, colloquially known as uh, the Brazil band. And so we can go ahead and actually uh, get that pretty easily by just using this return expected uh, set is equal to true keyword argument. And so we now return the CLS observed as well as the expected band. And if we run that, uh, you see it now, we just print that out. And so we have both, we have the nominal as well as the plus and minus uh, one and two sigma variations. Okay, so now that we've done that though, what we actually care about is uh, scanning, across very, uh, scanning across different test values of our parameter of interest to, and performing hypothesis uh, testing for our model. So, what we'll do here is we'll just uh, use uh, NumPy's uh, LinSpace to go ahead and create a, uh, an array of, um, of evenly spaced um, uh, test, uh, test values for our parameter of interest. And we're now simply just going to evaluate uh, our, do the hypothesis testing for all of those different uh, test parameters of interest and uh, get back the uh, get back both the observed as well as the expected set. And so we run this, and this is the most computationally intensive part, so that takes a little bit of time. Uh, but now we can go ahead and actually invert those hypothesis tests to set upper limits on our model parameters. Uh, uh, so if we go ahead and run that. Okay, so that's, that's pretty fast. And we see that we set, uh, for, so choosing uh, the 95% uh, uh, CLS upper limit, uh, we, we, uh, what's our hypothesis tests here are telling us that we can set that for a signal strength of uh, just over two. Uh, that's great, but it's also nice to try and visualize these things. And we don't, um, PyHF is being very intentional in the fact that we do not want to try and be a toolkit that does everything. Uh, we want to try and work in concert with the scikit-hep ecosystem. But for the, so we really want to just focus on providing the most efficient uh, uh, version of the HIST factory model that we can. However, just for the time being, we still do have uh, some visualization. So you can see here that we have this uh, contribution module inside of PyHF where we have this uh, visualization uh, module that uh, for the, and also a Brazil band uh, function. But we're not really interested in keeping this in there forever. This is kind of more of a, until this exists uh, in other compatible libraries. But if we go ahead and import that along with matplotlib, uh, then we can see if we now visualize uh, this that we have uh, here, actually, let me change those figure sizes to make this uh, a bit more readable. Um, uh, okay, so, um, right, so now you, you're looking at uh, the Brazil band uh, for different values of the parameter of interest uh, as, we, as we scanned across and then the corresponding CLS values. And if you remember, 
uh, we went ahead and actually set the signal strength, or we, we, we set the 95% uh, CLS upper limit at a signal strength of just over two. And when we go look at the visualization with this red line here uh, being the 95% uh, upper limit, uh, we see it, it, that happens just over, uh, just after we cross over two. Okay, so we've now kind of done uh, a very much of a crash course introduction to uh, inference using PyHF, uh, but let's now actually look at some real world examples. So that was all toy stuff, but let's do this for real. So, um, so PyHF uh, and our likelihood serialization scheme have been has actually been used in the real world. Uh, there is a phenomenology paper that has been published that used PyHF to do reinterpretation studies. Um, also, uh, the Atlas Collaboration has released a public note uh, all about uh, reproducing searches for new physics uh, uh, using published full statistical likelihoods that were, was done using PyHF. Uh, there's also a, a nice uh, CERN news article all about that. So these are all hyperlinked. So if you want to just right click, you can go read about that. Uh, and then as was shown uh, earlier this week, uh, we were very excited as well to learn uh, that our friends over at S models uh, are also using PyHF for likelihood studies as well. Uh, go check out that uh, really great talk by Wolfgang if you haven't yet. Um, but then as was mentioned, we've now been able to preserve the, the full likelihoods and they're also being published up on HEP data. So as of today, as of PyHEP 2020, Atlas has published full, four full likelihoods to HEP data. Uh, and this is one of the most recent ones uh, here, which is um, uh, a SUSE uh, analysis, uh, doing a search for electrolinos. Uh, and this is one of the first ones to also use something that we call the patch set, uh, which is, uh, allows us to basically store all the background and uh, signal JSON files that are needed to reproduce all the likelihoods for all uh, signal or uh, for all signal model points that you might want to scan for your final um, for your final plot, your final limit, uh, to put those just into two uh, JSON files and then just uh, be able to store them in a tarball. So when you go ahead and download this, you actually just get a tarball with two JSON files in it, and that's exactly what we're actually going to do. So uh, here is uh, some uh, a bit hacky, but totally fine uh, code that is, that's going to do exactly that. We're going to just um, query this public URL for that likelihood uh, tarball, and we're going to download it here. And then we're going to extract uh, uh, that into a, t uh, into a tar file object. So we'll go ahead and import things. Uh, that takes a little bit of time just to, to download. Uh, so I think that ran, I'll also refresh here. Yeah, we can see in the uh, viewer in JupyterLab that we now have this 1L, 1LBB workspace file. Um, we'll now also just uh, write some very um, short functions that are simply just going to extract the, the JSON from the tar file. And then also then once we've done that extract, uh, from the uh, extract the background only JSON file as well as the patch set file for a specific model point. And patch sets uh, are basically a, a nice feature of JSON in which they allow us to uh, take an existing background only uh, JSON model and then just patch on a Sigma model on top of that, which is really convenient for reinterpretations. So we'll go ahead and run that. And then uh, here, this is just a nice little helper function, which is going to calculate the CLS values for us for a um, a given background only and signal uh, JSON patch file. Uh, so we're just simply constructing a workspace, constructing a model, and then performing a hypothesis test, and then bring those results or return those results. Uh, so we'll actually do that right now. Uh, so we'll now get the, uh, the background only and the signal patch files. And this will take a little bit of time, especially because we're running up on binder. But now when we go ahead and evaluate this, we're now calculating uh, the actual uh, CLS values that are reported in a published uh, analysis um, for model uh, for model mass points of 750 and 100 uh, for the for this uh, electroweno analysis. Um, this is taking a bit, this is taking quite a bit longer than I, when I ran out of my machine, but I was also using a different backend. Um, so I'll take this moment to mention that PyHF supports not only a NumPy and SciPy backend, but also a TensorFlow backend, a 
PyTorch backend and then also a JAX backend so that we can take full advantage of automatic differentiation, uh, as well as GPU acceleration and vectorization. Um, this, is, this warning is not something to be concerned about. This is simply, OK, it finished. That's simply just saying that when it starts off, it kind of bumps up against uh, an area and balances off. So we'll now simply report that. Uh, and we now um, see that we've calculated the observed CLS value as well as the expected band. OK, um, right. So uh, as a, I think I have about 10 minutes left. So I'm simply now just going to show some like niceties and some fun things. So some of you might be familiar with uh, the popular Python visualization library, Altair. Uh, and we've also found that it's pretty easy to be able to take advantage of the fact that you can actually write declarative uh, plotting specifications with Altair and then visualize uh, things that you might want, you might care about in his factory or in the physics analysis. So we'll go ahead and import a few things. So we'll import PyHF, we'll import uh, NumPy and Pandas and Altair. Uh, and then we'll go ahead in this uh, visualization notebook, we'll once again load the model and get all those things. We're going to reproduce uh, a, we're going to reproduce um, our scan over the, our different uh, parameters of interest. And we're now going to just visualize some of uh, using a pandas data frame what some of those results were. Uh, but now we're going to define a declarative specification for how to actually make the Brazil band plot using Altair and uh, uh, Altair's charts feature. So we're going to have uh, two bands and two lines, and then uh, we're going to add some interactivity on top of that. And so I'll just go ahead and execute this. And we now get an Altair plot. And as you can see, as I mouse over it, it now also in real time will go ahead and tell me what actually is the observed CLS value for the specific parameter of interest value that I'm looking at. Um, right, so, and I think with that, um, I might have less than 10 minutes left. Uh, and I'm also out of material because I didn't really plan this too well. So uh, I guess we can probably just go to questions. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Matt, for that tutorial. Um, so you've got a couple questions coming up. Um, I will, uh, share my screen so that way we can see them together. OK, great. Uh, do I need to stop share for that, or does it on I think it kicks screen? you off automatically. Yeah, yeah it does. Excellent. OK, great. Um, let's see. So um, yeah, maybe let's, let's look at Gordon's question, which is the top one right now. Um, can PyHF participate in a full analysis optimization using some of the differentiable programming that we've been discussing? And what work is left, if any, to support this? And is it planned? Yeah, uh, so the short answer is yes. Um, that's definitely a part of uh, our goals. And then um, with my putting on my Iris Hep hat, I will say that as a member of Iris Hep working on the analysis systems team, this is like definitely something that we're uh, strongly considering is using PyHF as part of uh, the end uh, bit of the full analysis systems pipeline. Um, so what are the things that actually need to be, so let's see, what actually is there in the question? Some of the differential programming, um, what left is work, what left, what, what work is left to support this? Uh, in addition to just uh, produce, uh, finishing off some, uh, some, some features that uh, a typical analysis might want to use, such as, um, uh, such as adding in pseudo experiments, uh, the ability to use pseudo experiments to be able to actually set limits, uh, which many people might need to use when they aren't actually in the asymptotic regime. Uh, for differentiable analyses, we need to do a little bit of work because almost all of the PyHF likelihood is fully differentiable, but there's just a little bit of, at the very end, there's just one or two key pieces that aren't. Uh, we actually have some issues open right now. Lucas was doing some very nice work uh, earlier this week on kind of attacking those because we were, ex we're also excited to try and have a fully differentiable model. It's not just uh, uh, Nathan over at EOS. Uh, so yeah, this is very much uh, on the roadmap, if you will. Cool. Um, and then uh, maybe next we can move to Ben's question. Um, are there still Atlas analyses that are using Hist Factory um, directly? and to what extent are you seeing use of PyHF outside of Atlas? Yeah, uh, so um, I we are Atlas is not moving 
fully 100% towards PyHF. Um, I mean, there's obviously analyses in which PyHF is just not the right choice. Uh, if you want to be able to uh, do uh, some parts uh, with unbin fits, then you're not using the his factory model to begin with. So given that PyHF is the Python implementation of his factory, we're not the right choice there. Um, and then also, as I think everyone can appreciate, there's just a little bit of uh, inertia when making very large changes to things that as uh, experimentalists we care very, very much about, such as making sure we get our statistics right, where we need to go through the uh, validation steps to, to show that, um, that the results that we're getting with PyHF jive and are consistent with, uh, with the root implementations of his factory. Um, I'll go ahead and tip my hat a little bit here, or tip my hand and say that so far, we're very happy to, to say that that's happening across the board. And we're also very lucky uh, to, have, um, to have Jordan, who is one of the, on the core development team, being a leader, a co-convener in the SUSE run two summaries. And it's been really nice to see that um, many, many analyses in, in the SUSE group are both adopting PyHF and finding it to be uh, compatible, giving compatible results, and also, uh, I think, uh, fun to use. Um, as far as adoption outside of Atlas, uh, it is true that PyHF is mostly an Atlas thing. Um, we do have an issue open talking with our colleagues over at CMS on how we might be able to try and unify uh, areas of, of combine along with a his factory so that uh, if you have a combine card that you, you might be able to have a translate that we can write a translator to go from combine to uh, the, JS the PyHF JSON specification and back. We already have this for the uh, root, uh, the root plus XML uh, that exists for uh, the root implementation of his factory. So we see no reason why we shouldn't be able to do that with combine. We just need to sit down and uh, do some uh, uh, kind of hashing out of what's actually happening under the hood. Um, and then also um, uh, Hans uh, very kindly invited uh, PyHF a while ago to give a short uh, summary of what PyHF is and what it provides uh, at LHCB uh, as well, because I believe um, there are at least some analyses on LHCB that might be interested in using the His Factory statistical model when they're actually doing benefits. But uh, as we know, um, especially for um, uh, LHCB analyses in particular, usually tend to be looking uh, um, Jonas, maybe you can drop the word in the chat. I'm completely blanking on what's the very particular type of uh, fit that you guys do all the time, but uh, unbin fits are something that for most L uh, LHCB analyses kind of makes sense, but there might be some room for negotiation or, or cross uh, experimental help. And am I remembering this right, that it's, there are some use cases of PyHF outside of HEP also? Uh, yeah, so um, I haven't been, uh, this is still preliminary at the at the moment so far, but uh, in my SciPy 2020 talk, uh, if I can give that another plug, uh, you'll actually see that we've been able to also do some, uh, I'm going to emphasize this exploratory analysis of uh, Fermi-Lat data, because uh, you can take the Fermi-Lat data that's openly available, and then you can uh, think about the, you can, you can think about the gamma ray counts as basically being Poisson counts in some sort of strange two-dimensional histogram, which is the sky, and you can then <laughs> actually do use PyHF to do a statistical model uh, of that and actually do statistical inference. And um, so uh, this is something that I I don't I think there has been some initial negotiations or not negotiations, some initial kind of conversations happening around this, but there hasn't been actually anything like officially published at the time being. Uh, I'll also just take this, uh, thanks for that, that question, that's good. Uh, I'll take this opportunity just to mention that everything that we have shown here today is all about frequentist analysis, but let's say you're a diehard Bayesian, that's totally fine too. Again, the likelihood is really what we're doing here, right? And the likelihood can be something that uh, the core part of the likelihood can actually be shared across both frequentist and Bayesian analyses. And we've already seen that um, that you can take Python libraries such as EMC and uh, PyMC3 and extract out the uh, extract out the PyHF likelihood and actually perform reasonable Bayesian analyses using it as well. So the fact that we are implementing this pseudo frequentist framework is not 
uh, is not by any means a wall. You can still do Bayesian analysis if you're interested. Great. Um, we're running low on time, but we've got a couple questions that are more directly tied to your tutorial. Um, so maybe you can quickly address these. Um, sure. Is it possible to get the expected CLS values without providing any data? Um, yeah, so um, yeah, so it, yeah, so you're saying, can you get the CLS values for just the background only? Um, I'm going to assume that's what that means, uh, and uh, yeah. Great, and then um, there's a, a question about the version key for JSON schema. Yeah, uh, so the the JSON specification is a specification, and so uh, right now what we basically have in that JSON spec is what we would call his factory 1.0 or like classical his factory, and um, so but his factory is an implementation of a given statistical model, but you might want to do something that extends his factory, or you might want to say like okay. We've found some way to work with CMS to actually have uh, this specification for the model also be able to deal with combine and the other parts that actually go into the combine model. Uh, that doesn't fit just in the version 1.0 spec. So you need to extend the model. And so you likewise need to extend the spec. And so, but if you give a JSON uh, specification to PyHF, it needs to know what version you gave it. Um, so in the same way that you're version controlling your software, we're version controlling our likelihoods. Nice. All right. Um, maybe let's end on this uh, last question because I think there's one that's maybe more technical that we could look at on the Slack. Um, is there a recommendation on when to use which backend? What should I consider here? Um, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> I guess I would say it really depends. We're so full disclosure. We're still trying to understand what all is available, uh, what it, what actually are the advantages and potential disadvantages uh, between all these backends. And we also, while we are taking advantage of the nice work that's been done, uh, we have we don't necessarily have everything profiled out to know all the uh, to know everything, but to know exactly what areas are small or taking a long time and what what areas are uh, in one back end versus another. But I will say just from our collective experience uh, on the analysis we have done so far that the PyTorch back end is blazing fast. Uh, from our experience, I think it's just because it's very intelligently using uh, multi-core processing. So I would say go ahead and if you want to just try and see how how fast you can crunch through some uh, CLS values, I I would uh, install the PyTorch backend and go from there. Awesome. But also, please report back. We're we're interested in this stuff as developers as well. Okay, we're about ten minutes over time, so um, let's thank oh, okay. Matt and Anna again for your time, and um, we can continue with these great questions on.